How are you guys doing? Good. Does everybody, everybody have to have, have breakfast? No. Have lunch? Did you have anything to eat yesterday at all? No. 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 We love insanity. That's why we're here right now. I wouldn't go there. Well, no, this is no, if we are the patients, you are the doctors. Uh, you have to cure us. Yes. Have, has anybody here actually seen the show called uh, uh, oh, yeah. It's yeah. four letters, four letters. It's, it's a that, double X. It's, 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 it's Dr. It's Dr. Lex. Something, something like that. Nope, nobody's seen it. Nobody's seen it? We haven't seen that one. What's that? We haven't seen that one, but we've seen Lex. Oh, yeah. How's it going? Why don't you tell a little bit about it just in case people haven't seen it? Well, does anybody seriously not have seen the show? <laughs> you haven't had yeah. Lex is about a, a very uh, tall, muscular man. <laughs> right, Johnny. Who, who looks a lot like me. Uh, he's got on to better things. And, um, and, and handsome, handsome. And the other one just reminds me. He's incredibly good looking. Um, and uh, he uh, he drives yeah, really good looking. Wow. 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 Seriously good looking. Seriously he's stunning. And uh, anyway, a bunch of people in space and they do shit. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they step out of it, you know. So who has a question for us? <laughs> Actually, it's kind of weird. And you guys who have seen the show probably realize that like every we get what we call four seasons or they call four seasons we just show them you know say the words and we try not to bump into the furniture oh. and uh, that's the actor's job right <laughs> say your lines don't bump into the furniture thank you very much now go home um uh each each season uh had sort of different elements do you agree yeah yeah, yeah. you know season one was uh about jet and so well, two, again, that's genius. Let's be fair, it was a series about a robot head. It was a series about a robot head. And there were some other people doing stuff. A good looking <laughs> robot. <laughs> Seriously. With a stunningly rock hard ass. Still. <laughs> and boys. <laughs> Where do we go from here? You gotta help us out, guys. <laughs> I think I better moderate this panel like the last one. I was gonna give you a break. I just wanted to start with my stuff on the Let's uh, start at the beginning, please. Did the camera shake then? Yes, it shook. It shook. It shook <laughs> into your stunning handsomeness. Jeff Hirschfield, why don't you tell us a little bit how you got involved with Lex and your start with that? Well, thank you, Alan. I will. Good. Please do. <laughs> um, uh, my story is I was studying uh, acting at the University of Alberta. Oh. Where I now, Alberta, uh, Alberta, where I met uh, uh, Michael McManus. Well, Michael Four. Okay, is this in and out? Take this. Take mine. Take all. Take my white sleeve. I do my own. Um, so uh, I've known Michael since uh, I guess about 1983, and he had somehow, in strange and mysterious ways, hooked up with uh, Paul Donovan. Of Salt Street Films, he'd done uh, did some of Paul's films, as had uh, uh, Brian and others, but I didn't know that then. And uh, so Michael was my connection to Paul. I had written um, a play for the Fringe Festival, the Edmonton Fringe Festival in 1985. Which is one of the best Fringe Festivals in the country. Well, and it is. Yeah, it is. It is. Yeah, it seriously is. Thank you so much for that. And uh, it was kind of a big sneaky hit. Uh, sort of a retarded comedy along the lines of uh, something about Mary. And uh, there was a guy who tried to make it into a movie for years and years. Anyway, he eventually sent it to Paul. Did this sort of shotgun approach, sent it all over the country. He eventually ended up with Paul. And uh, Michael's connection with Paul, my connection with Michael. Paul was cooking up a series called The Dark Zone. And uh, we met in Toronto and uh, sat for coffee and said, well, I, I like your script. You know, if I ever get, and he kind of talks like that. Uh, I like the script, and if I ever get this show off the ground, I'll give you a call. And I said, yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, a year and a half later, uh, as I was about to go out the door to get a job as a waiter again, 
Um, he called, called and said, okay, we've got some money, let's do this thing. And from then, he uh, wrote uh, many drafts and many scripts for a year and a half, brought next to Rock on board, went down to Los Angeles, the wheel of was Showtime, and uh, lo and behold, about two years later, a show was born. Senior, thank you, Jeff. I know some of the people have already been in the last panel sci-fi. How did you start getting involved with Lex? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Marco Walters. Don't even make me cry. But when you did Lex, did you feel, did you I feel? I felt him? so empowered and uh, <laughs> that, that was the last time. <laughs> that was the last time. Oh, you missed still giving him your Well, it's, it's funny you ask me, like, how did I get involved with Lex since we still have the least? I'm like, what, what's Lex again? <laughs> well, uh, when you were how did I get involved with something that Jeff just explained? <laughs> um, when did I get on the big, huge dragonfly? Um, well, like uh, some of you probably heard it on one of the other panels, uh, that I took over the part from Eva Habermann, beloved Eva, um, in uh, 98. Um, I don't even know why. Why she stopped playing the part? <laughs> You know what? She had some. Uh, uh, she was offered uh, German uh, Baywatch. Was German Baywatch. Baywatch. Uh, the <laughs> North Sea. I don't know if you guys have ever been to Germany. Have you ever been to the North Sea? Pretty it's cold. A, it's yeah. uh, suppose days. if you're a girl, say you were, and suppose you had a tight brassiere on. Okay, suppose, and then suppose put ice cubes okay. down inside that brassiere. It's that. That's how cold the North Sea is. It's <laughs> <really cold>. <laughs> 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 doing, doing a Baywatch. <laughs> Yeah, I did the German translation of the show was Ice Cubes in Your Speedo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I got a real huge success and I have to, I have to ask for speaking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, yeah, I got up the part all of a sudden, um, like really all of a sudden, because I was uh, on the Grand uh, Canarian uh, Islands, um, Canarian Islands, yeah, actually not Grand Canaria, but to one of the islands, Fretlipura. Uh, shooting for another German TV series, and all of a sudden my phone rings, and I, someone tells me, "Well, you have to come back to Germany right away because there's this Canadian producer who wants to see you." I'm like, what? I guess I can because I'm working. <laughs> well, yeah, but he's really interested, and he just he he says like he needs to meet you. Like, well, fine, but uh, then he has to stay till Christmas. Well, no, he's going back to Canada. Well, too bad. So I was I had no clue what he was talking about. Sex. Like, what sex? That since I told in the yellow panel, like we uh, didn't have Lex then in Germany. Uh, now we do on the sci fi. Unfortunately, nobody watches it. Maybe three people in the whole country. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's a huge audience for Lex out in Germany, I tell you. Um, anyway, so um, I tell him, well, you can meet me if you're so desperate at the airport in. Uh, Newark uh, between Christmas and New Year's because then I'm going to the States and so that's not very far from Canada, is it? <laughs> Meet me there. And I mean, I was talking to, to Paul Gunnar and I not knowing who he is. Okay, so he said, yeah, fine, just let me know the exact date and we'll meet there. And I said, well, could you give me a rough idea, like what this is for, what this is about? He said, well, yeah, it's a science fiction series uh, about this uh, huge a uh, ship, um, a dragonfly out in space, and we have some people here, like the crew, you would be part of them, and um, and uh, they fly around and make all kinds of things. Oh, great, that's a good explanation. Good enough. <laughs> I mean, I should read him and do this audition. No, I mean, he explained a little more. And he also sent me, uh, like, one of the first four movies to give me like, someone up. Impression. And you still do. And the impression was so <laughs> damn good that I said, oh, I want to be on that, on that ship. I want to meet that Stanley Tweedle guy. And uh, so, yeah, I went to uh, Newark Airport. It was four hours delayed. He was still waiting for me. He had probably like three liters of coffee. And uh, he saw me walk out of the airplane. I waved. My hand was waving too. And he said, you're the bomb. And I said, yes, yeah, no. <laughs> almost, almost. Um, yeah, that no, was a very brief our uh, meeting, really. But uh, he was convinced, like very quick, that I was the one. After having seen this uh, one little short movie of mine called Hilda Humphrey, which I've talked about before, also, uh, which also has the wicked sense of humor. Why did I say also? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so it had a 
Why is that any humor? If I can interrupt just two for one of the things that Paul said, uh, uh, he had a lot of wonderful things to say about uh, about Xenia. <coughs> about what's her name? Uh, yeah. <laughs> one of the things he said is, you know what? She has no bad angles. <laughs> no bad angles. Please give it up for Xenia Seaver. I was on a bus, oh. <laughs> driving across the Argentinian Pampas in uh, Iowa, it was like 1985. And, uh, is this, this a true story? story? This is a true story. This is a true story. I'm making sure for the uh, journalists here that this is a true story. Okay. Does everybody have a sleeping bag? They <laughs> walk. <laughs> but there's one of those things, it's kind of like, you know, like when sometimes a light goes on and you realize like something you're doing has Meaning that's more than anything you can ever explain. But I, I, as I was on this bus driving across the Argentinian Pampas in the middle of the night, like, like four o'clock in the morning, the bus comes to an abrupt halt. I look out the window, the front window of the bus, and there's this flood of water going across the desert. And uh, and uh, I try, I go to the front of the bus and I ask the guys, okay, uh, it's a sign from the gods. I've been shooting a, uh, something with Paul Donovan, Crater of Lights. Guy was the, the brains and the mind, and, and really is, is the heart. Although very few people would ever like think Paul has a heart in a way. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just because I date Never Paul and politics. you don't. <laughs> is this a true story? It's a true story. Okay, I'm just telling you. But it's one of those things. I, I, um, it's like the gods are saying something. Somebody, something is going on, conspires in the universe. So every time. Paul has called and asked me to do anything. I'm there for it every single time because there has to be, a, a, you know, more a, a more than an element of trust. There has to be an element, I think, uh, of faith. You know, thinking like the guy knows what he's doing, no matter how bizarre it sounds. The last thing that we did together was uh, the conclave, and the conclave, yeah, it was a, was set in uh, 1458 in Renaissance Italy. About divorces, about like a bunch of priests who are kind of nasty guys. You think, really? <laughs> you think people are gonna like that, Paul? Yeah, but you have to like at some point just give yourself up to those things that stop your bus in the middle of the Argentine desert and say, you should be going back there, boy. You should be going back. It's like that. So when Paul uh, Paul sent scripts over to me and I read them and I thought, guys, out of his freaking mind. He's totally out of his mind, and uh, but I thought it's it's a nice out of his mind. It's a, it's a very interesting out of his mind, and uh, anyway, I say yeah, yeah, yeah. Ash, want know the real story? Yeah. <laughs> so Paul asks me. Paul comes up to him. Hi, Brian. Yeah, Paul. What is it? Uh, Brian, I had this idea. Want to do a feature film about a, a gigantic uh, space penis? <laughs> What did I do? Did I, I used to have that word when I said space. I think we're all See, that's why we work so well together. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, flew to Halifax, shot for a day or so, uh, down in a, in a shipyard down in the waterfront in Halifax. I leave there, and uh, Paul says, oh, okay, right, I want you for this role of standing tweet. I say, yeah, great, great, great. So I leave, I go back, and I'm, I'm getting ready to do a theater festival. It's a year later, more than a year later. And I phone call for a reason. That's how much what Paul does, right? Okay. You should try to shake hands, shake hands with Paul. Um, and uh, Paul, hi Paul, how are you doing? Great. Brian, remember standing with Wheeler? <coughs> yeah, yeah. So, the house, I thought it was some guy that was in a fur. So, yeah, Stan, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Stan's okay, is he? Oh yeah, Stan's gonna be very good. Oh, that's nice. Why is I talking about this guy? I don't remember. And, uh, well, Stanley's actually done a pretty good job. Great! <laughs> so, he says, uh, I'd like you to come over and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and do it. 
Do you stand with? I don't, I've never met the guy. Oh, you know, we were going to do this guy. So actually, that's how, then it became clear as the conversation went on. You know, remember, oh, that thing, well, you, that's what you're talking about. So that's really how it happened. And it, again, it's a, one of those things, again, putting your faith in the guy who you, who you have trust in. Anybody here ever done that, just like for some reason in your life, you say, I know what I gotta do. I have no idea why I wanna do this, but I wanna do it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Something in the guts. Yeah, you got it. Now, Ellen Dew is like, you're a very interesting woman, and you played, I think, one of the most interesting characters on these series, and, and you kept sort of uh, uh, coming back over and over and over again in the series. So, uh, how did you get involved in the first place with, uh, what's it called, Lex? Well, I think uh, some of the people have already heard the story, so I'll give them the abridged true version. Um, they were some, uh, uh, True has nothing to do with that. That's it. A traditional audition. And the, the scary part, I actually forgot to mention this the other day at the panel, is I remember driving down downtown Toronto. It was in Chinatown on Spadina Avenue. It was a little warehouse to do the audition, and I had no clue what I was going to do. It was Stanley Tweedle's monologue, because I didn't have a script, about the women on another planet. And so it was, I'll give you an idea how Paul was thinking of Stanley. Yeah, exactly. Or else read the part. And I went, okay, I can't just stand there. I think I mentioned this in the last panel. I can't just stand there and read this. I love women. I want to have sex with women. It was one of your speeches about a planet. And I went, I'm going to do something outlandish. And for those of you who didn't hear this, did you hear the story, what I did in the audition? Yeah. You did. Okay, journalists, don't tell them the story. Uh, what I did was I made it a sexual fantasy dream, and I lay on the floor because I thought, okay, this is so outlandish. I can remember this audition. You probably still don't have oh, that. Oh, I, I was there. <laughs> and, uh, I was so there. I literally um, performed, I literally had a solo symphony. I'll put this very uh, gracefully. I, you know, I touched those parts, but I took my shoes off and I caressed my legs and I read it and I, and I did the audition as I was having a sexual female wet dream. And apparently they remembered me and I went back. <laughs> For those of you who are on that boat cruise, yes, I did a strip and you don't kill the table like mine. And, um, we, I, I, I now. Oh! oh, oh. <laughs> and uh, I, I made it all night. Really? Yeah, you still are up. And... <laughs> which is one of the most memorable, char memorable characters I've ever played. And what was great was I kept dying and coming back as different characters. So I got to work with all of them through all the seasons and uh, <coughs> had a great time. And Brian and I have had this wonderful on-camera, we're sort of like how we are now, banter in terms of our relationship. And it's been, it's been really, it's been very easy. Let us talk about the departure of Lex from other sci-fi shows. I'm moving on right now, the moderator. Jeff. Tell us the difference between the traditional shows. I know some people have heard this already on other panels, but yeah. why was Lex, or why is Lex so different than other shows for you? Well, uh, uh, and in my early discussions with uh, Paul, it's like, okay, so with the sci-fi, I haven't really done much of sci-fi, what, what do you have in mind? And uh, he was actually quite clear about it in his soft-spoken weird way. He said, well, look, the science fiction that's out there is all very uh, heroic. And I mean, that's great, all the, but Star Trek and most of the things that are, uh, are out there are uh, Star Wars, the, uh, the whole uh, uh, the whole lexicon is all uh, very heroic stuff. People are very noble, they're in for uh, uh, great causes and noble causes. And that's all, that's all fine, but there was a lot of that out there. And he had said, nobody's sort of done anti-Star Trek, Star Trek's uh, ugly sister. <laughs> and he thought, that's where we should go with this thing. And I was like, okay. And uh, as I said on the previous panel, I came up from a, a comedy background. So I said, okay, well, how far can we push this, man? Like, how ugly do you want to get? And um, he was very uh, uh, clear about that, too. Because for a very, uh, uh, for 
very quiet, hard to read guy. He's actually uh, completely filthy. And, uh, and uh, totally, totally unorthodox. And uh, he's a real anarchist for all of that. And um, he said, yeah, and basically we talked for a while. And he said, uh, we agreed that total, total anarchy would be the, the rule of the day and anything goes. And uh, so I thought, well, again, coming up from comedy, that sounded really good to me. And uh, uh, as I said in the previous panel, we struggled a lot with that because the, the network showtime that we were dealing with just didn't understand that. They wanted uh, Joseph Campbell kind of stuff. They wanted, they kept trying to push us back to the heroic, um, the heroic Star Trek model, which although I have immense respect for it, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do Star Trek as well as Star Trek, so what's the point? So he had a, a Great idea to let's you know let's do the dark underbelly and the twisted, funny, retarded stuff and, <laughs> and boy did we ever. See one of the things that I liked about the whole idea. We'll go back to just two seconds and I'm just going to just pop in for a second. Sisters don't speak down here. Uh, it's your, it was your idea. Um, was that there are some elements, as Jeff was saying, about sort of conventional or usual uh, 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 shows of all sorts, sci-fi or whatever. There's, there's always, uh, you know, a cause to be fought for. If you're thinking sci-fi, there's a whole planet to defend. There's some place you're trying to get to. And one of the things I liked about it was that you don't know when this is, you don't know where this is, and the guys that are out there have no idea why they're out there, just happen to be there. Like most of us in everyday life, suppose you're in a taxi, you get the taxi, like, I, I want to go. Taxi driver says, where? He says, I, I don't know. You know, it's like that. Uh, and there, there are some elements that are very, just very articulate about it, and I'm not. Um, it's like, how come it is that in all these shows, the good guys very often win the day because the bad guys can't shoot for shit, you know? Um, why is it that you uh, assume certain things will happen? Why is it you assume that there's, um, there's going to be a, a heroic figure who's going to lead the, 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 the gang to you know, a wonderful destination? You know, and I thought, the captain of this ship is a klutz. <laughs> he was there, he's an absolute freaking moron most of the time. And I thought, that's, that's how it is. Because I know that, you know, um, that's, that sort of reflects a certain kind of truth that's normally not shown. You know, we're supposed to think, like, you watch TV, and like, you're supposed to get some sort of inspiration, I guess, is what people hope or get some relief from daily life. And I think Lex offers you nothing. <laughs> There's nothing to be gained by watching that show. Well, there's some good laughs and some good scenes where you get I don't think so. I know. It's very weird. It's incredibly no, weird. You can't take your eyes off of it. It's like you a have to, you have to You better look away. No. It's like you'll, you'll grow hair on the palms of your hands if you don't look away. <laughs> So I, I would never, I would recommend you never again watch the show. <laughs> why, 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 why are you here? <laughs> that's absolutely insane. Anyway, uh, that's why I, 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 I've hated every moment of it. Um, <laughs> no, I love it. And, and you know, one of the great pleasures of doing the show is to have so much uh, fun, you know, when the camera's rolling and when the camera stops rolling. Jeff and I know that, you know, we, we, we did that. Uh, once. <laughs> <laughs> one, time, yeah, one time we had a little tiny bit of fun. It's kind of okay. I don't know. They don't know what to do with you. I don't know what to do with so. you. Senior, go ahead. <laughs> Take us somewhere else, please. I can't follow that. They will know. They can't follow that. Like, okay. Well, we really all loved the show because it was so weird and so different in every single way. And it's been, uh, of course, also for me, like, different from anything I've ever done before. And uh, although I didn't really have like the full, um, I mean, I didn't get like the full vibe when I first watched the, that one episode that Paul had given to me. I mean, one of the first four movies. I thought, hmm, well, this is weird. But then he told me, well, we're going to change a lot of things too, and. Uh, like especially like your character because uh, like I said in, in another panel like it was very hard to take on a part that already existed um, and uh, I mean a character. <laughs> 
So uh, I said, well, I can only take this on if, if I change it completely and then go into a different direction and then go into my direction and just uh, explore. And um, I think exploring, that's, that's the right word for the whole series. <laughs> in general, right? <laughs> Big exploration <laughs> in all ways. But uh, I mean, seriously, I've never had as much fun uh, in my whole acting career so far. You know, and on this show. And I mean, did you see the, uh, the, the, the making of things where uh, Ellen is, uh, I think it's the making of season two, where Ellen Dubin says, I think, one of the most revealing things about the show. And uh, she's, what did, there's did, a say? What did you what, what she said was, uh, uh, she's talk, you're talking about Chigarata in the pot of boiling water. We did that in the, in the studio of the cleaning up. And, uh, and Ellen said, you know, uh, here's what you said. Uh, most people will say in the business, the less is more. <laughs> And she said, but in this show, more, more is not enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was good. I like that. Thank you for that. That's true. More is not yeah, enough. Definitely. And I would say as actors, because everything was, we were actually at the time when we did the show, it was everything was underplayed and mumbling and on television, you know, and everything was Everything was like that. And what was great as an actor was this, we got to go to town. No holds barred, censorship, no censorship, sexuality galore. I mean, this guy, he must have had things, objects sent to his crotch 80 million times in the show. What was great was that this guy was kind of toyed with a lot, sexually. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Playing okay, it was a lot of my guys. There, 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 was, there was a bit, you, some of you guys I know have seen this thing, there's a bit where uh, somebody, I don't know where the hand was, I can't remember exactly what the episode was, but some, but some hand, all you see is his hand coming in and grabbing Stanley's crotch like this. And I remember I, this uncle. Only one show? Oh, just, yeah. So the hand is there and it gets released and, and I remember, uh, on camera I said, if, if he says again, <laughs> I'll kill him. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it was it was like that. No, we, we had such a great time. I mean, it's a very unique show. Like, as you can tell, it was a very natural show. Yeah. <laughs> natural, especially like with our bodies. But you know, what's interesting Parts. to us is that we, you know, it's just a, I'm still laughing. I'm still laughing. I gotta tell you, this is the most fun. I mean, I touch what I've been working up a storm like most of the people up here, but I gotta tell you. I mean, this is the 10th anniversary of Lex yeah. this, this week. So I, mean, I can't believe that we're still here talking about it. Yes, we have this weird underground call calling in. As I said the other day, you may not like the show. A lot of people don't, but they'll never forget. Yeah. You will never forget. It's not a plant. You know, it's not a derivative show. It's definitely unique and will go down in the anals. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's like, so you say that. And, I, and I'm going to move on um, to, to, to what else? One of the things that that, uh, that that Paul has done in the past is is um, kind of like I, I I wouldn't exactly call it groundbreaking, but it's sort of like he always asks the question, why not? Why aren't we doing this? And he, he'll do things. For instance, we we were, as a matter of fact, the very first sort of sci-fi show that did a musical. And when uh, when uh, you know you guys <laughs> said, you know, hey Brian, we're going to do this uh, musical show about you know the history of Kai and Rune G and I thought, oh right, great. <laughs> I thought there's no way. I, I I don't know. This this will never work. But as as happened, um, people that watched that episode really like it quite a lot. I know that some of you guys had, and know the lyrics for all the songs. Um, when people were coming to Halifax they had they'd make the costumes knew all the dance moves, knew all the choreography, knew every single action, Brigadoon, that it was it was great. So those sorts of things are were always a surprise, you know. People who couldn't die, died. One of my favorite moments uh, looking at the show, and I haven't seen every episode, um, was that if we have this hero, it was Barry Bostwick playing Bowden, the the you know the conquering hero who escapes from impossible an impossible situation. And uh, yeah, we're at the very first episode. And then it's like 15, 20 minutes in, and the guy dies. You know, <laughs> just kills him. Are you killing Barry Bostwick? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> <laughs> so the, I guess the deal was that anything is possible. 
you know, and, and if we don't have to like stay stand with the, the normal rules, as, as Jeff and Alan both said, uh, you know, you don't. The rules are not there as th something that must be adhered to. There are things as sort of guidelines that you just go away from. You just move away from that. Any questions? Over here. As we know on Lex, there is lots of very sexually provocative scenes. Some very minuscule. Really? Yeah. <laughs> in, Some in, very in, minuscule. In, in, in the show we do, just this one. There's yeah, that one, yeah. You said sexual? Sexually provocative. Uh, uh, okay. Ignore it. Okay. Keep, keep, keep it down. Keep it down. <laughs> But some very minor, and some very in your face. Now what I like to know is how do you get from the writer's concept of what his idea was to what Xenia did, because most of them were with her. Like was it, okay, I got this idea, I want you to do this, and she says, there's no way you'll ever make me do that. <coughs> you know, or like how do you guys work that out to what the finished product actually was? Go ahead. Go on. Well, Please. you know, when, uh, <laughs> um, whenever I had a scene like, 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 oh, I can't even think of, were there sexual scenes? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. um, well, like I said in the other panel, actually for me, it was a great freedom that um, she was just transformed into a love slip. <coughs> I always have to keep that in the back of my mind, that it wasn't really something that she <coughs> chose to do. It was just something that she had to do just like eat and drink. So therefore, um, even if it was or had to be something very provocative, then uh, I mean, I knew that she was this character, so I would go for it. Um, and uh, I mean, the writers were very kind that they would not write anything that was like way beyond what I, as an actor, would do on stage or oh, in a movie. Oh, they try hard, but I beat them all. Um, I can be really, really cool and a very nasty person. So, so whenever they wrote something that was just not up. Did you ever, <laughs> did you ever find anything that you didn't want to do sexually? Actually, uh, actually, no. I mean, it was very clear right off the top. I mean, when I first talked to Paul that I was not going to do anything where I was going to be completely nude <laughs> or where anything could be seen that shouldn't have been seen. I think there's actually one episode where something slipped through a bathtub or something. Um, and it did happen. Uh, cannot be seen in the States, but maybe here in Canada. Because <laughs> <laughs> we love that sort of thing. <laughs> but it just happened. It was not, um, not a choice. So uh, we decided very early on, like, uh, she can be very sexual, and it can be like anything I can do. It should more, always be like a big, big tease to uh, whoever. <laughs> To the audience, maybe too. Um, she could be incredibly attractive and sexy and do all kinds of things, but we're not going to show something like too much of her body, not really. So, um, and since that was clear, <laughs> they could write whatever they wanted to. I, I just had really, I had fun playing with it because um, since this character was such a playful nature to begin with, I could just, uh, even in situations where in real life I would have been like. I feel, uh, I don't know, ashamed or um, would blush um, with her, since maybe she had never had this experience before. For her, this was like a child discovering um, a new playground. So uh, she didn't have a sense of, uh, oh, this is not morally correct. Um, and that gave me a big freedom. One of the things that, uh, that, I, that, that uh, uh, you know, Obviously, if you've seen the show, uh, there's no shying away. Uh, the, the writers didn't do it, and we didn't do it as, as actors, none of us here. Uh, there was no shying away from things that, that every human being does every day. Um, okay, well, you don't have to shower every day. Well, you have to shower okay, well, every second or third century. Um, but, like, there's, you, you have to eat. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I liked was uh, Paul would actually invite ideas from us about certain things. And uh, we talked about, well, okay, you're watching Star Trek. They have their few drinks. When do these guys ever have a sandwich? What do they eat? Okay, so we have to do assume. Do they have anything? No, they don't do eat. They don't eat. 
they don't shower, they don't take a dump. And I thought, let's let's see it all. Let's let's see the toilet. Okay, well put in the toilet. Oh, yeah. They're they're <laughs> camping. There's no toilet paper. There are no there are no big forests in space. So how do you know, how do you clean up after you you know gone to the you know Mr. Happy? Uh, well, guess we're just gonna have to lick your ass. Okay, well great. That sounds great. You know? Everything's natural. Like I said, really natural and organic. This is the way the ship was made. The guys have to sleep. And why do we always? It, it was uh, I think very fair uh, that the character that that Michael's character Kai sleeps in this you know uh, this big refrigerator. Uh, but what about the other guys? You know, uh, uh, Zeb and and, uh, and and everybody else. On, on, they've got to sleep somewhere. Let's give them just a bed. But it's got to look really kind of strange. So you know, called good idea. You know, and 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 so it was one of those things that um, that I think makes the show seem uh, just, it's kind of like in some ways I think when you see it's kind of off-putting. As Ellen said, uh, you may not like it, but you won't forget. It. <laughs> Next question. Tony? One of the hallmarks. You look really good today, man. Oh, <laughs> really? That's what you said last time. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's just between us. <laughs> just a few all One of the great hallmarks I thought of Wes was that when you're watching it, you're thinking, the only thing really sicker than the fact that they filmed this was that someone had to write it first. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one element in, in the fourth series that I, I have to have <coughs> Jeff. Haley has carrots. <laughs> <laughs> bad carrots. Oh, oh bad, bad carrots. <laughs> oh, maybe you better explain bad carrots. Where? Where does that come from? Where? Where? Your own personality. Go ahead. I want you to answer that one. I, first, I just want to say that I, I have children, <laughs> and they're young now, and, and in a few years you're actually going to watch this stuff, and I think they like me now, and it's going to be really interesting in a couple of years when they go, when they come up to me and ask me that same question, Daddy, Daddy where did the alien ass carrots come from? <laughs> I was trying to feed you, don't you understand? <laughs> Whatever it's uh... <laughs> <Hey>, Well, um... <laughs> I actually, I actually don't, I, I actually don't know. I don't know whether it was, I can't remember it, whether it was my idea or Paul's or Lex's, it was, uh... It was some horrible combination of all three, but we definitely wanted to do some kind of uh, invasion of the body snatchers thing. And um, but again, most of that stuff was there crawling in your ears and nose. I mean, it was a simple case of uh, being Lex trying to do a difference. Like, well, if you're going to get invaded by some kind of uh, parasite, mind control parasite, which is a classic sci-fi horror thing, and we never shied away from addressing all of the uh, uh, Conventions and the classic notions. So the natural question when you're writing Lex is, well, w where else can they get into? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we go, okay, what's the one that hasn't been done? And that's what we do. Bath door carrot. That's right. So hand carrot. <laughs> and speaking of that, like, I, I, one of the things that, one of the episodes that I, I think is uh, sort of telling in that way about, about, uh, about the way the guys, you know, uh, Jeff and Lex and Paul, uh, thought about it and wrote about it was a, a, an episode called uh, Lap Trap, which sort of, it was, it's, a, it's a, sh a show, it's on TV, and it's a show that sort of takes the mix, you know, makes fun of TV shows, like different genres. Was actually brilliant. <laughs> Which was a great freaking idea. It was, you know, terrific. Not only making fun, but also revealing about how uh, how the TV industry works. Really, yeah. I mean, that was the greatest thing about it. You know, it all looks like it's great fun and uh, and uh, and, still really and, cool. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you're ground up into a bucket. <laughs> well, <laughs> so okay, so okay, well, next question. Hi. Could you um, 
I've come into a bit on the sort of recurring decapitation motif running through this. No, I'm not going to Decapitation? Yeah. Uh, I think it sort of reflects on how the guys uh, thought of themselves when they were writing it, you know, like, uh, let's lose our hands, let's, let's go crazy, let's go totally mental. Um, and uh, I don't know, Jeff, why I, I, decapitation? I, I, I actually don't know, it's all sort of a big sort of blur now after a while. <laughs> Um, it, it, it has something to do with talking. Show. No, yeah, decapitation, I mean, you, you kind of have to look at all, I mean, there's decapitation, uh, a lot of bondage, male bondage. Yeah. Stan was, uh, a lot of insertions of various kinds. Stan was always getting tied up and inserted. He'd stop me in the hall and go, do I, do I have to get tied up and inserted again? <laughs> uh, yeah, I meant you do. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll play it. So um, I really, I really don't know what to say except that yeah, getting decapitation was only one, and uh, you know the bodies really were stacked up like cordwood. I mean, people are always dying in messy ways, and uh, or having no body, like I didn't have a body. Or having yeah, yes, yes, yes. Bobbing no head in a bathtub shaped like female genitalia. Just a body kept saying, "I want a body. I want your body. I want your body." And he kept thinking we wanted to have sex, and I literally yeah. wanted a body. So there was all kinds of weird decapitations, uh, mutilations. I found out recently that Paul went to like Jesuit school. And, he did? Uh, yeah, I think oh, so. Wow. And so I think we're just putting a lot of it off onto that. I think the answer is Jesuit school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. will lead to decapitation. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yes. Blame the Jesuits. Does that help? It's just a sick. <laughs> sick. <laughs> anyway, any other questions? We probably have time for one more question, I think. Karen? Yeah, in, um, in I wish of his shadow, um, his shadow being improperly cleansed, that's his own agenda to disprove the prophecy that will be defeated by the energy. And at some point in the movie, he changes his mind. And, and I don't think there's an explanation anywhere in there of, of why that is. I think it's I think it's there. I think it has to do with uh, with uh, a, an ego. It's like it's like you know. Have you ever you know decided in midstream walking down the street, said, you know, you're going to meet somebody in a in a in a restaurant or a bar, and you decide, you know, I don't really feel like that. So you just it's a you know. I think it's very simple. It's just it's an ego. Just changed his mind. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I wish we could say more, but uh, we're really stupid. <laughs> Any other quick questions before we wrap this up? Thank you guys for coming. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you on the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you.